Okay. So, welcome again. <laughs> we are speaking English today, so that we understand. And okay, the idea of the today presentation is to go a little bit deeper inside the uh, dog architecture, so that we can understand what are the requirements, what is the structure, and what are the differences with the respect to the real implementation that we know is not completely varying uh, our ideal architecture and structure. Okay. Um, so, uh, should we wait? Summary. That means what we are uh, doing today. Uh, the presentation is a bit long, so we we'll try to be fast. But if you have any doubts, or problems, or ideas, just tell me. Okay. Uh, I start with a very, very simple and uh, a short introduction to an intelligent domotic environment, just to fix the ideas of what we are uh, referring to, and then. Uh, uh, I will start directly on the architecture, on the system architecture of dog, so uh, where dog uh, is inserted with respect to the, to the rest of the, of the world. And after that, there are a couple of slides, just uh, let's say less than 10 slides. After that, we go deep, really deep inside the dog architecture, and we analyze uh, almost all of the modules inside dog uh, to try to understand what I expected to do and how they are implemented. Okay. And finally, we end up the presentation with a couple of guidelines for development so that any, anyone who is going to deal with dog uh, on the, the development side knows what are the best practices or what are the, the, the usual problems that we encounter programming. Okay, so what's the general picture? The, the general picture is uh, uh, basically, uh, the point in which we uh, started the last of presentation. So, uh, we have a couple of different network technologies. We need to be uh, interoperated and bridged and controlled as a single technology. And so, we have these technologies, and this plus sign means everything is integrated and uh, managed by a single gateway. So, this is the starting point. Uh, why we need dog? Because we want first to bridge the networks, second to add some additional functionalities like uh, uh, intelligence. What means intelligence in home? It's not, uh, it has nothing to do with the, the, the human intelligence, but it is just a kind of advanced scenario programming plus some reaction to the context inside the home. Okay? So no intelligence here, actually just programming. And uh, the other reason for which we have a gateway uh, between, uh, let's say, the human and, uh, and the automation technologies is that uh, the gateway is expected to abstract the technology to enable all the applications to interface with different technologies that might be in home with the same, in the same way, with the same commands, with the same uh, interaction with that. This is the general system architecture where uh, basically we have uh, a couple of things. We have our networks here. Uh, we assume that the network have uh, the hand of communication capability. They communicate over a bus or over uh, Wi-Fi. We already know almost everything about technologies. Uh, but what we are assuming is that there is a gateway between the technology, the low-level technology, and an IT network. So our first assumption is that we don't know anything but IP. And this IP basically is delivered on Ethernet connection or Ethernet compatible connections like Wi-Fi PC. Okay, so the idea is that we have a PC, we have a, an Ethernet port on the PC or a Wi-Fi port, we connect this PC running dog, and we can communicate with all the networks uh, in the environment. On the top of the figure, uh, of the picture, we have dog and the application and the user interfaces. So what we are doing is trying to divide uh, the approach into two main areas. One is uh, 
related to the low level network, one is related to all the other level applications, all the level seven applications. And though that's a, a kind of uh, connection between the two layers, where the connection means abstraction of the devices in one sense, uh, transformation of the low level protocols into a single event based protocol is spoken on the top of level of the architecture. And uh, creation of a, of a layer of API so that all the other applications can uh, access and interact with the environment by having a well-defined set of functions, set of messages to execute. Okay. So that's the role of the inside the system architecture. And on top of this, we can build everything almost. So we can add directly user interfaces, like in on displays, uh, uh, an interface on uh, smartphones, on tablet, uh, and whatever. But we can also have some kind of data analysis tool. If we are thinking of dog in an industrial environment, we, we probably not have an interface, or we will have an interface which is much farther from uh, Dog and the uh, network, and in between dog and interface, there will be a thick layer of analysis handling the data coming from the feed, for example, uh, aggregating the samples, computing uh, derivative measures like uh, average uh, or maximum or whatever, um, maybe performing some uh, business intelligence on the data, etc. So. Interruption. Um, these are almost all the blocks around dog. Okay, so the idea is that we have this difference, these two layers, two layers. And what we are going to do today is to try to uh, unpack the dog and see what's inside. And this uh, this is our first mantra. <laughs> we start. We have a couple of uh, guidelines uh, and. Uh, we call them mantra because uh, it's something that once that one must uh, repeat to itself every time it starts working. Just to remember what are the assumption and uh, what are we doing here. So our first and most important uh, mantra is uh, in ontology we trust forever in every aspect of dog. That means uh, when dog performs it, its work. Uh, interfacing on the low level networks and on the high level applications, it exposes all the low level features according to an ontology representation of them, which is called the law, and nothing else should be exposed. So if I'm exposing a lamp, a lamp is something that can be switched on and off, it has a state that can be either on or off, and nothing more. All the uh, network level stuff should be messages should be uh, made invisible to the application layers. Okay, so that's why we say in a social with trust because that's the interface. Uh, and on the other side, since we must expose everything on the basis of the bond, we must also use this knowledge inside the dog structure. So that we can actually translate the low-level representations into something bigger than dog. Because if we don't have this knowledge at different degrees in different bundles, we cannot adhere to the dog view of the environment. Okay. So this is a kind of first step we need. We always need to respect before starting the dog. That's why I put the, the in ontology we trust slide before everything, before even seeing inside of. 
because this is the reference. Anything else uh, is just fresh, okay? because it, it just leaves uh, for a few solutions with no uh, possibility of being maintained for long term, at least in our view. So, no special implementation, no special access point, just in the long term. Okay, so uh, making this sure, uh, we can go inside the architecture. Uh, we will see that actually, uh, in some point, uh, this mantra is not respected, or it's respected in the architecture, but not in the implementation. Okay. And these are problems, these are points uh, in which we must intervene. So the idea is that after this presentation, we know what are or at least we can imagine what are the critical points and also where we can start uh, studying and uh, modifying the architecture to respect the, this high level. Okay, so starting very high level, DOG is basically composed of three layers. Okay, uh, one layer is just functional layer, it's something that exists apart from DOG. It's just used as a, run, as a kind of a runtime, uh, and it provides some basic functionalities for uh, supporting modularity, uh, for supporting running on different platforms, for supporting the ability to migrate part of the architecture over different machines. And this layer is the lowest one, which is called OSGI. It means uh, uh, Open Source Gateway Initiative. It's the name of the consortium, but the idea is that uh, actually, it defines a set of guidelines for programming, plus a baseline API that provides uh, the basic implementation of these guidelines. And what permits uh, OSGI is to uh, support uh, the concurrent running of different, let's say, applications. I think the OSGI framework are called bundles. We have the ability to run one independently from the other, but at the same time they can one attach the other for consuming or for providing services. And this uh, loosely coupled architecture permits to, uh, on one side, to have uh, a kind of uh, plugin based working, like uh, we have drivers for the network. Every driver is a bundle. Every bundle might be in or not, but if it is in, it can use the services of all the other components of the architecture for providing its own services. So, for example, for providing access to a network technology or not. And in theory, not in dog, I'm saying, okay, but in theory, these bundles can run at the same time on different machines. So, I, I can have a part of dog running on one PC and the other part running on another because the SGI framework also provides the infrastructure for communicating between two or more frameworks or running on different machines. So the idea is that also distributed operation is supported by, by this basis layer. And that's why we are basing everything on, on the OGI framework. Moreover, it defines some um, device access specification that basically regulates how the software should access the functionalities of the device. And this is really useful in our case because we are actually driving devices with DOG. Okay. So there is a standardized way for doing that. And if we have a specification, we, we can adhere to it if we are sure that everything is coherent inside the platform. On top of the SGI layer, uh, there is this driver layer. The driver is a set of bundles. Each bundle, or Better. Each subset of bundle, inclusive how, uh, is responsible for maintaining the communication towards a specific domain. Okay, so we have a couple of bundles, usually at least two, uh, that are uh, responsible for a given network. I have a, at least a couple of bundles for uh, the Connex network, one for the Macomb network. And these drivers have the role of uh, abstracting the low level messages to the dog on representation. So if something is happening on the network, someone is switching on the lamp, 
we receive a kind of strange message, maybe something like SMS to one SMS sharp in the case of BTC no networks, and we need to convert this to lamp one, which is the kind of protocol seen by all the upper levels. All the upper levels up on the drivers, they reason using uh, the long representations. So everything is expressed in the on top of these drivers, and this is on top on the architectural uh, layers, but it doesn't mean that uh, the driver can live without the higher levels. In particular, there is this core layer, which is the core of those. All the bundles cannot live without the core, at least the still being dock. They can live on the SGI framework, but they, they will not be not anymore. Um, and the core layer has the uh, responsibility to coordinate all the actions inside DOM and to provide the basic functionalities. That means common execution, for example, even delivery, rule based programming for the platform. These are the base services. Without this, the drivers cannot run. They can be installed in OSGI framework, but they cannot run because they don't have a good layer for them. Uh, and no service can be provided to external application because the bundles composing the core and exposing the services of those as an API are missing. Okay. So this is the most important part of the architecture. The Hutton part means that everything can run without the add-ons, and they usually provide uh, more advanced features like uh, power estimation in the case of the top of bundle, um, rule programming for external applications. So an external application can inject some rules inside the platform, for example, for uh, interoperating between different plans. If I have one plan on one technology and the other on another technology, I can program a rule saying that when I press the button one on the KLX technology, for example, the LAN two on the my home technology should be uh, switched on. Okay. And this can be done by programming a rule engine running inside a set of the adults buttons. So the idea is that they are plugged there and they enhance in some way the functionalities of them. But without preventing him uh, to work if they are present. Um, on top of these three layers, there is all the rest. That means everything that can interface DOC. And this everything usually interacts with DOC using uh, a web based protocol that might be XML RPC, uh, that stands for XML based remote procedure uh, calling. Okay, so we basically call a function using a transport based on XML and HTTP. But this is like calling a function in a, in a usual programming language. Or on the other side, uh, we can support communication using a REST approach, where we are building uh, communication based on REST approach and exchange of JSON messages. The difference between the two is that by using XML and RPC, at this moment, we can have a, a, an even driven interaction also on the application level. So we always keep open two channels, one for receiving comments from the application, one for sending back events. On the other side, on the REST interface, uh, we can work on an event-based interaction modality because the REST interface is designed just for being built. So the application is responsible for Calling dog every time to get up updates about the current state of the house. So that's the main difference. Okay. Okay. And this is the general picture. Now, what we are trying to do is to go deeper in this three components: the core first, and then drivers and dogs. So, as we can understand, what are the linear modules of dog and what, how they are working? If they work. Okay. So. Core. Uh, this is the core. Don't be scared. There are a couple of uh, 
But the idea is that uh, all these modules collaborate together for providing the top function. Uh, we try, me and Luigi, to uh, divide the modules on different architectural layers uh, depending on what they do inside the core. So the core by itself is a kind of layer that uh, and on the bottom layer, we have the libraries, then we will see what they, they are meant to. On top of the libraries, we have the base functionalities for, uh, for the layers. So these longer uh, bundles are just used for enabling all the rest of the architecture to work. And so we'll go going higher until we reach the application interface. And you can see here that's an XML endpoint which is providing XML RPC communication towards the application, so I'll find a block. And there's the corresponding REST endpoint which is providing REST based communication. So that's the idea. From support, let's say, to application level functionalities. And this orthogonal module is there just for. Uh, reminding that this is needed for running everything outside of the uh, development environment. So this is a kind of start environment which enables all the other to start in the right order. Okay, this is just a preview. Let's go deep inside this module. The recent points. Uh, let me check if this is the first or I just two times. Was, okay, he's right. Okay, recent point is uh, under development. Okay, so what I'm saying here is possible of modification changes, discrepancies, and so on. But the idea is that uh, it provides a REST based access to those. And this REST based access can be based on JSON messages or XML messages. So the syntax of the messages can change, but the interaction is a REST based. And it is still under the level. So, no much more to say about it. It's the kind of interface. Then we have the counterpart, which is the oldest one, uh, and it provides XMRPC access to Docker. It is based on a, a two way connection, so, it is at the same time a server and a client. It's a server for listening to application requests. So an application can send a command, the server listens to this command and triggers some execution inside of dog. But it can also act as a client for delivering events. So the applications must register themselves to uh, this layer, to this bundle, for being notified about events. Okay. And this is, this is the only way in, in XML RPC for having the two-way channel. For being even based, it uses, like in the REST part, it uses also here the, some XML messages, okay, and they are defined according to vocabulary, which is called the message. Okay, I'm not saying anything more because this might be one of the points to analyze. Okay, um, okay, so two bundles for application access. What's just on the uh, lower layer, immediately lower, lower layer? We have a couple of bundles. Let me go back. Okay, a couple of bundles. As you see, the names are different, and they are uh, all on the same layer because they pretty much do. Uh, Things at the same level of abstraction. Okay. So they run on devices representation, which is this new layer, and they provide some, in some way services toward the higher levels of computing. But they do not have anything in common, or they have very few things. Okay. So don't expect uh, strict relations between them, although they collaborate together. So the state monitor, as the name says, 
uh, provides a constant snapshot of the current state of the house. So everything that, that's happening on the network is uh, transformed and uh, captured from the low-level technology up to this bundle where it is stored. So in this bundle, I know that, for example, the projector is on, uh, the lamp in the kitchen is on, and so on. without needing to uh, query the low-level because this is a snapshot. And of course, by being a snapshot, it can be, in, at some points in time, uh, different from the real state of the house. Because there's some latency between the messages coming up from the house and storage and the provision to be uh, It not only manages the, the state of the house, but also it provides the Registration from state change listeners. So applications that might be in this case both other bundles and external application to the XML RPC layer or to the REST layer. These applications can register for state change notifications. So they can listen to state changes in the house. And the bundle is responsible for notifying them is the state change. And it tells us only states, states and state notification, nothing else. If there's a measure coming up, it passes through another bundle, not to the state. Okay? Because it, it's not a station. On the other side, this, this bundle uh, not only supports listening, so even based interaction, but also querying, because we know that we have some kind of interactions where uh, even based uh, communication cannot be provided, for example, in typical operation interactions. But also because we may want to query the state of the house, of the house at specific points in time for performing some action. For example, for running rules, we need always to know the state of the house. In this case, also, SimWolf is providing query functionality. So we can query the state of the house through this bundle. And we can query uh, this state in two ways. The first is asynchronous, so we send a query, then something happens, and then after a given time that it's not constant, it's not granting, we receive back a response saying, okay, the state you request is lamp one is not. Instead, if we need a synchronous state of querying, because, for example, we are doing something this time sensitive, so we need the state this time and not after three seconds, there's a synchronous interface. The difference is that the interface is blocking, so if we are calling this query, then the bundle or the application which is calling the query is blocked until the query results come back. Okay. The scheduling part in dog is done by the dog scheduler. Uh, this is used mainly from uh, external applications. There are a few uses inside of dog for this bundle. And it is used for scheduling recurring tasks. Typically, uh, commands on the network or uh, ma typically measure queries, for example. So if we need to sample a sensor at a given uh, time interval or at a given frequency, we can schedule a, a sampling task using the dog schedule. And then this bundle uh, will take care of sending the right comments to the right device every time interval we program in. Okay. Um, this is usually uh, adopted for scheduling comments, so we can schedule, for example, get measured on a single device. For scheduling state requests, and this is done for example by the state monitor that schedules the request for the state of all the houses, of all the device states, for example. Uh, and then there's also another possibility, but as you see here, I don't know why. <laughs> because no one is using it, so that might be another point to, to refine. 
We can also schedule notifications. Okay? But this is actually not needed because the nature of notification is an event coming from the low level network up to the application. So we don't need to schedule it is as simple as it's coming as soon as it is available. Okay, so that's why I was highlighting this with some question marks around. Okay, so the architecture is there, but the implementation is some point of failure. Okay, so the executor, as the name says, it executes copper. So the idea is that. We try to separate the functions inside of. We have the state monitoring, we have scheduling, executions of comments. This execution uh, is basically based on a three step uh, process. We receive the comment from outside, from the other bundles, or from the application. We validate the comment, so the comment should be syntactically valid against the logon representation. So if I'm saying length one up, the rest of it is that the length is not half common. Length is just a no. Okay, so there's a validation at this level. And then the common is sent down to the network or to other bundles if, the, if it's something like schedule uh, anything over there. Uh, there is a priority on this common message. So I can ask to execute a command more fast than the others or more slow than the others. And this priority is specified by using uh, an integer number where the higher numbers meet the higher priority. Okay. And this is another point of attention because usually lower numbers meet the higher priority. So this is exactly the opposite. Second, uh, usually there are well-defined priority levels in application. Here, there are no priority levels. Okay. So this is a, an implementation specific detail, just to say, okay, everything should work like this, but there are some idiosyncrasies inside. Okay. So we just start me if I'm telling something. Okay, uh, device manager. This is completely different bundle. The main part of, of this bundle is to manage uh, the networks, the different domain networks who are, who are interfaced by both. It basically handles the availability of drivers for the devices and the presence of such devices inside the home. So whenever a device is present in the home, is bracketed by corresponding, uh, let's say, class representative inside dog. And the device manager uses this class and the list of drivers, all the bundles who are exposing their services as, as drivers, to find the best match. So I have a device, I have a driver, and I have a, are you able to handle this device and to what degree? Then there is a kind of evaluation of uh, all the possible matches and one is selected. And from that point on, the device and the driver are associated one to the other. Okay. This is uh, specified by the OSGI device manager specification. So this is nothing uh, invented from scratch. This is a specification. So all the steps are uh, defined by the specification and all the elements taking part in process and it is really useful as it allows to have a kind of plug-in uh, driver device attachment like uh, in a modern computer for example. So you plug in a, device, a USB device and you get to recognize it as soon as you plug in. And the same uh, happens in DOC. So if the drivers are there, you put on the nature of a new device, hopefully you configure Point, but maybe in future we, you can recognize it present on the network. And once you have this couple uh, device driver, they get attached if they are compatible. So might be a flashing lamp, for example, which is the 
land that flash you seen in some cases can be attached to a lamp driver, which is which is uh, only a partial support to all the functionalities of the lamp. But if it's on the only driver available, then you might get that. Okay. okay. This last bundle is the let's say the counterpart of the executor bundle. In the executor bundle, we uh, deliver commands from top to down, uh, so from the application to the network. The notification manager does exactly the opposite. So it receives notifications from the network and provides them to all the listeners. So to all the bundles or the, or, uh, the application who are registering as even listeners. Uh, also, this notification manager is uh, uh, standardized by the OSGI specification, and uh, the specification is given in service, so there's a specific pattern of interaction for, uh, for the delivery of events and the part of the registration. So every bundle of registration should respect a specific pattern, and it is based on the given publish and subscribe model. Uh, model. So the notification manager is publishing events under a given topic, for example, all, uh, all the LAMP events, and all the listeners register for a given channel of events. So, for example, I want to listen all events coming from LAMPs. In that case, uh, the notification manager would deliver to those listeners all the uh, events about LAMPs and not about doors. So that's a topic usually in the registration. That specify what are the kind of events that uh, uh, want to listen. Um, there is also one functionality who is not finally behaving family in the specification. Okay, so this is uh, different from the standard, and it is used for filtering uh, so called inner state changes from the outer state changes. That means uh, there are a set of messages, a set of state changes coming from the network that should not be exposed to the application. Might be because they need further elaboration before being exposed. Might be because we may want just to store them in the same snapshot and to avoid application listening on, on the, the notifications. Because maybe they are uh, too frequent or maybe they are uh, of any significance for the applications. For example, there are kind of in operation states being delivered by the networks that we don't want some application to be able to listen uh, to this in operation because maybe they, they don't need it. Okay, so that that's this difference between inner states and outer states. And of course, by being different from the standard, this might be a failure point. It depends. Um, and this is the other switch thing. Actually, this bundle should only be special notifications, but there's this stage change notification also. Okay, so here is another kind of architecture violation. Interview implementation might be. And uh, the second part is there because this bundle is filtering from inner states to outer states. That's why it is also handy state change implementation. That means uh, we are not sure if this is an error or not, for example. Uh, it depends on the design choice uh, we take on, on DOG. And the idea is that uh, all the events inside DOG should refer to this specification. What actually happens is that, is that not all the events are respecting this event uh, specification. So before deciding if this is correct or not, we need to analyze the inner part of dog, of dog and to understand what is compliant to the specification or what is not. Uh, we need to remember that the dog, uh, that the dog uh, gateway has been developed by incremental steps. So, as like all the incrementally developed uh, softwares is going to uh, 
encapsulate non-compliant piece of code. Uh, some kind of shortcuts uh, dictated, for example, by uh, time frames or time frames in the and so on. I'm, I'm trying to describe the entire architecture as, as uh, it should be, plus the differences. At least the one that we know. Okay. Okay. So this gray layer was all about, in somewhat, handling. Uh, the functionalities, the core functionalities of, of those, without saying anything about the devices, without saying anything about how to um, interact with those devices. And this is partly uh, a task of the blue layer, which is a, a representation layer. The blue layer basically provides representations for devices for the home environment and for all the configurations that define how a specific home environment is uh, implemented in the real world. So what's the difference, for example, by this room and another room? Okay, on the left side we have this device factory that is basically used for creating the device software counterpart when a device is plugged on the network. So when DOC starts and there is a device configured, then inside DOC the device factory creates an instance of device that represents the physical device. Okay. And this instance is used for sending commands to the real device okay, through the device driver attachment. And it is also used for driving the attachment process. So it's a, a kind of representative of the real device itself. In all sense. And these devices are defined in the home model, which can either be provided by the semantic house model or by the simple house model, depending on the dot okay. And both of them are based on the dogon ontology. So the idea is that the environment is Described using the GOM, and then depending on the kind of installation, there might be a runtime usage of the ontology. In this case, we have a semantic as model, or just an offline user of this model, and in that case, we will have simple as model. And this is usually more suited for uh, devices with the, um, constraints on the computational power of the machine running on. So if, I, if they are running on an embedded PC, we don't have enough computation power to handle directly the ontology, so we run the simple house model. Okay. If you are running on a PC, no problem, we can handle directly the ontology at one time. Okay. Then, uh, by remaining on the left side, under the dog device factory, we have uh, uh, some contribution to the device representation. So we have this device class, so this device class is can be part of a set of categories, let's say. Uh, and all these categories are defined by the world. So we have a complete reference model that gets implemented inside that. Okay. And so we have this library of all the possible representations, where there are instances, where there are classes for all the types of devices, in this case, they are represented as Java interfaces. All the different functionalities that device have, so we will have an enough functionality instance, for example, for representing the ability to switch on or off something. Uh, we will have state classes to represent the actual state of the device, uh, and state value for representing the value of that state. So if we have a lamp, a lamp will have an on-off state that can have either an off state value or a non-state value. Okay. And all these classes are represented inside this Dogon library. This Dogon library is composed by around the 400 classes. Okay. But they are not developed by hand. They are just programmatically generated starting from the ontology model. So that's why we can use all these uh, 
representation, very fine representation of the devices because we don't have to program them. Otherwise, we will need just one month for programming the library. At least. Okay. Uh, and besides the, the Go library, there's uh, the implementation part. So we define how the devices, uh, what are, let's say, what are the functionalities of a device, what are the possible states, the possible state they use by using the system classes. Then we will have a prototype device, something that defines what are the functions, what are the methods published, offered by a device. Okay. So the difference is that while in the world library we define a kind of interfaces for devices, here we define abstract implementations. Okay. So the dog device model provides the abstract implementation for all devices by handling all the OSGI related functionalities. So we have all uh, what we need to put the device inside the OSGI framework and to make, make it available for uh, the attachment uh, process and so okay so that's the difference and also these models come from the ontology they are automatically generated from the ontology so the uh, device model and the gold, and the, the gold library are two bundles two library bundles that means they do not provide services they just provide class implementations basically and they are automatically generated from the ontology and that's why they were on the left, under the device pack. Because this log is all about devices. So, the abstraction of the device is in all the possible ways, according to the On the right side, there is the model. So, the runtime model representation that allows to uh, represent the actual house configuration when dog is running. So, what are the actual devices present in the house? Uh, what they can do, uh, what are their configuration parameters. For, so, for example, uh, my LAN is actually connected to a complex plant. I need a group address to, to address the LAN and to send comments to that. All this kind of information is managed by the model and made available by these two bundles. And as you see, the simple as model is uh, drawn like uh, a sub part of the semantics model. And this is done purposely because what we want to highlight here is that this simple as model is just uh, the offline representation of the semantic as model. So if we don't have enough computational capability for writing the semantic as model, we generate an offline representation of the model, who is managed by this simpler model. Okay. Um, Okay, so um, the semantic as model is one of the most complex bundles in technology. Uh, Luigi, correct me if it's different. Uh, it does everything that has to do with the model. That means uh, providing home configuration. If the configuration is expressed uh, as a set of double instances, which is the usual way of representing. And providing the auto configuration means supporting all the configuration requests, including the first one, which is each the when dot starts and we want to know everything about the environment in which it is connected. But it supports more advanced functionality, like for example, model merging. If I have another model that provides additional description to the home. For example, there is a power model that describes all the power consumption of all devices in the home. Okay. This model, which is a kind of add-on for the base model, can be merged with the base model inside this model. So there are primitives for asking this bundle to merge to different models and to offer all its functionalities on the aggregate model. So after merging, I can query the aggregate model. 
And of course, of this, there's a merge, there's also an unmerge. So if the add-on banner, for example, requires to remove the model because it's going to shut down, then this bundle removes the model from the model that merge and provides all the functionalities that it provided before the merge. Okay. That means uh, it, it does basically ontology merging in the simplest way possible. That means only handling different keywords. Uh, the other functionality that the semantic as model provides is uh, to support classification and reasoning with ontology. Classification means that if I have a lamp or if I have a flash, let's say, and the flash is a kind of lamp, then I might know that the flashing lamp is a lamp and it can be driven like a lamp. So by sending on and off. This is done by classifying the instance. So by finding all the possible classes for a given instance. And moreover, we can apply some reason. So if a lamp can be switched on, and this instance uh, is an instance of a subtype of lamp, then also the instance can be switched on. And so logic reasoning in the model. Uh, it can generate automatically inter interoperation rules. Why? Uh, in the model, we represent the house. So we have all the, the descriptions of the devices, and we know that uh, the bottom one is on, on a convex network, and, for example, the lamp one is on a, I don't know, a mod button network. What we can do at the instance level is to say, okay, this button controls this lamp. And in particular, every own notification of this button generates a non command on the lamp. And every off notification of the button generates a non notification. And this can be done just at the model level. Okay? If we have these kinds of relationships between the two instances, then the semantic as model might write automatically the rule for connecting the two devices at runtime. So it writes a rule saying, okay, when the button one changes its state to on, then send the command on to the lamp. Okay. More feature provided by this model is to uh, provide access to all the properties who are not generally used by dog. For example, uh, for all devices, I know where the device is. Okay. So I know that the lamp one is in the kitchen. Actually, no bundles in dog are using this information. But maybe the application want to use this information for driving the user interface. So these additional features described in the model are exposed by this model, by this bundle. Okay, so we can query the bundle also from the uh, from outside the core, passing to the XML endpoint, for getting these additional features. And the last functionality is to generate the simple house model. Okay, so if we are going to install the model in a constrained environment, what we do is to run a, a full dog, let's say, or full semantics model, and generate the home configuration in the XML format. We will generate a very simplified model based on XML. We have an, an, a schema for that. And then in the constraint environment, what runs is the simple house model, which is basically uh, an XML uh, parser, let's say. It parses the model and you know, first access to all the features represented by this XML file. Okay. So it works like the semantic as model, but without having all the advanced functionality. So it cannot support uh, merging, reasoning, classification, all the advanced functionality as it's just configuration as it is. Okay, and that's the simple as What happens if they are both 
uh, available in the same dog configuration. Because usually, when we distribute dogs, we create a set of bundles, we put them in the right folders, and then we distribute them. And what happens usually is that we have both the models inside the same distribution. If both are present, that means that the machine on which dog will be running is powerful enough. So if both are present, the simple house model automatically shuts down. When it notices that the semantic house model is starting to run, then it shuts down. So if we want to run a, a constrained dog, what we have to do is to remove the semantic as model button, which is in turn just a job file in the proper. Okay. Okay. Then the base layers, <coughs> which are uh, fairly easy. Uh, there is this dog configurator who is uh, charged to provide configurations to hold bundles. These configurations are not pertaining uh, the house. So this is not uh, the house configuration. So where are the devices, what are the addresses? These are bundle specific configuration. Like for example, if I am a driver bundle, I need to have a port on which to listen, for example. Or, uh, I don't know, if I am a bundle who needs to perform some polling, I need to have a poll time configured, and so on. And this dog configurator is providing these configuration parameters in a uniform way to all the bundles. And this configuration is delivered by implementing a specification of the SGI framework, which is called the Managed Service Interface. So all the bundles needed some specific configuration implement this interface. And when the configuration is available, they will be uh, delivered, uh, it will be delivered to the uh, bundles offering this interface. Okay, there will be an updating uh, call saying, okay, there is a new configuration for you, read it, start, and whatever you need. Okay. So this is for any bundle specific configuration. And of course, for example, this is used by the semantic house model to load the ontology, to load the history. Because they have specific configuration for the semantic house model. Winter is providing the configuration for all the house to all the other models. Okay. okay. Logger, as the name says, provides all the logging facilities to Docker. Not only the core bundles, but all the bundles in Docker can use this logger for uh, logging messages. These messages can be debug messages, information messages, warning errors, and they can be stored either on a file with a rolling appender, typically. So we will have a, a file that, after uh, growing to a given dimension, will be rewritten. Uh, or it can directly log on a, on a console if, if we are running dog for test, for example, and we want to see the errors or to see the messages directly on the console. And we can uh, tune the uh, login level provided by this uh, logger bundle. And we can assign different appendages. That means we can uh, store the logs on different supports depending on the login level and on the classes. So if we want to look at the semantic as model logs and store all the others on the file, we can write a, a proper configuration for the logger to do this task, okay? Perfect. Last, then we can take a break and let knowledge permeate our <laughs> brain, maybe. Uh, we have libraries. So these bundles do nothing in them. They just provide functionality. Just provide libraries inside. They are divided according to the functionalities they are providing. Okay. So the dog library provides all the inner functionalities of dog. So for example, all the definitions pertaining the messages exchanged inside dog, all the service interfaces, so the semantic as model as a service interface, so I can query the model in a given way, 
this interface is defined in, it, in this library. Uh, the core level notification are defined here. There are a subset of notification who are not pertaining the uh, devices, so a particular state or a particular nature or a particular condition of the device, but they are about a particular condition of the dog gateway. So, for example, one bundle is ready or uh, one bundle is needing something and it's sending this notification. Uh, so they are not defined in the bond and they are confined inside of, they are not exposed to the needs of application. And their uh, format, let's say, their interfaces are defined here in the library. And once more, there are uh, some kind of utilities also. So if we need to parse a message or we need to do some recurring task inside of it, here we will add the classes from doing that. Okay. No, so these are just utilities. Okay. The other libraries are basically wrappers for actual libraries, actual Java libraries that can be used also outside of them. Okay. But for being available and then usable inside the framework, in particular inside the USGI framework, they need to be wrapped as bundles. Okay. And this permits to avoid the uh, duplication of the libraries in all the bundles that need them. Because we can directly pack one library, for example, in this bundle, one in this one, and so on. But if the library is the same, we would have duplications. Instead, what we do is to pack the common libraries into a bundle so that all the other bundles can use the library functions without the Okay, so the JSB library is for a serializing, deserializing XML messages. Okay, and this is a, it's implementing a JSR uh, specification. It, it's available from the Apache community. You can use it in all your applications without any problem, but in Dog, it, it is just wrapped as a bundle. So that all the bundles handling XML can use this library just for. Uh, the semantic library does the same by wrapping all the libraries it's needed for uh, semantic related functionalities. So it wraps the GINA HP library for any ontology, it wraps the pilot reasoner, and it offers a, a query facilitator, which is a class that basically acts as a wrapper for the query engine of GINA and pilot, which simplifies the composition of queries on the so this is, this is not a library, actually, it's a library only for dog. It's not available for uh, the other application because we created it. The only difference with all the other library bundles. But it, it's still a li it, it is still a library because uh, it's used by all the different bundles. Okay. So it's a kind of an extension to the standard gene. The major library does the same for measures. So there's a, a library for handling measures that means uh, integer or floating point values with the unit of measure associated for measuring physical quantities. And this library permits to uh, safely do all the computations involving different uh, unit of measure. So we find, for example, multiplying uh, but per hours, and we get but hours. If I multiply the both by amperes, I will get that. And so, so this is for handling real-world measures, and this library is also available outside of DOG. It, it is called JScience, it implements the JSR specification. And what we do here, additionally, is to define inside this library all the unit of measures which are not standard. So they are not defined in the international system unit of, uh, of unit of measures, but it is typically used in the residential building automation environment. So, for example, the kilowatt tower unit of measure only exists in the building and uh, home automation domain. In this international system, there is no definition for that because the, the measure is job energy. Okay. So, we need to define the conversions. And we use the JScience 
function and this for defining this new unit of measure. Other example are, for example, the apparent power, which is volt multiplied by amperes. And for the international system of units, this is just bar. But actually, it is represented as VA volt ampere. <laughs> okay. So we define all these kind of strange measures here. And the last one is uh, support for cellular communication. We just told that we always want to communicate over Ethernet to avoid problems. And so, but sometimes we need to speak on serial port. For example, that way requires serial port communication. Uh, Texas Instrument Watch requires serial port communication. And so, so even if we ideally want a structure, an architecture, where all the networks are bridged to the IP network, the Ethernet network, and then we uh, work on that. In some cases, we cannot. And here we have a bundles for handling all the cases where a serial port is sufficient. And this library has the only uh, peculiar feature that it requires different native libraries depending on the system of which dog is running. So here you can find Java classes used for accessing library functions, plus native files for running the library on the different machines. So you will have a DLL for running on Windows, a module for running on Linux, and so on. And this is an open source provided. I think it's Apache also. Anyway, it's open source and also native files are provided, so we don't need the wheel and other stuff. Okay. And this was the core. <laughs> quite heavy, quite long. <laughs> Just a small part. Okay, so uh, let's try to look at the drivers and the add-ons, then we, we may have a small break so that we can try to understand everything and then move to the implementation guidelines after the break. Uh, drivers. We want to control <coughs> Some domotic networks, some different domotic networks. So we need drivers for them. Drivers are needed because they attach the device representation and then permit external application or inner bundles to command or receive events from the real device, the drivers. These are the drivers that we actually support. Here we avoided to have a layer and view because this is a single layer. All the drivers are on the same architectural level and they usually do not interact one with the other because they cannot interact directly, they need all the upper layer to interact. Uh, and we have this couple of libraries, uh, these two KNX Net ID and uh, AED by TR for communicating with Connex networks. Uh, this is the oldest one. And uh, when the, the yellowish one is uh, for uh, the last protocol, last specification of the protocol, we know those protocols because we are in exercise with files, otherwise, we, we won't have the, the documentation. This is a kind of standard but closed protocol. Um, then there is this open webnet driver which is for uh, controlling uh, my own systems from the genome. This is an open protocol, but the bus uh, and technology is proprietary. Okay. Um, then there is the Z-Wave driver that we don't have actually. That means it is there, but the Z-Wave protocol is closed and you have to pay for having specific even for having just the specification, not the development kit. So this is a kind of reverse engineering of the Z-Wave problem. Okay. So it is not complete, not fully compliant with the architecture, not fully compliant with the Z-Wave architecture. Okay. So a subset of some of the Z-Wave devices and functionalities may be available to the developer. Uh, then we have a Modbus 
driver, uh, which is for a Modbus based network. This is easier to develop because the Modbus is fully open. So it's really easy to get the information to develop, to develop the driver. Actually, what we have here is basically uh, a meter driver and a kind of uh, switching driver. So we can switch on and off uh, logs and we can get the major problem. We do not have a complete coverage for all the device types to be fine. But the driver is there and it can be, be easily extended. Uh, the same methods for HTML. HTML is uh, a standard very, very similar to Modbus, which is defined by the HTML company, and it is basically running, for example, on the uh, electricity counters that we have in our homes. They are using long words and HTML. Okay. Um, but basically, it's a kind of Modbus. It works in the same, same way with the same principles. So. That's why we have also this drive. Um, then we have a, a very, very small driver, <laughs> which is a smiley, uh, which is the Texas Instruments driver. This is a, has been developed just for uh, allowing communication between a specific watch from Texas Instrument dog. So there is this kind, this watch, which is a programmable watch. We have two experts there <laughs> of, of this watch, and he has the ability to communicate over Wi-Fi connect, over let's say RF connection uh, to an, a, a USB key, which can in turn be connected to dog through the serial API. So we have this serial bundle that permits us to interface the key and communicate with the watch. And this is a kind of different device. It's not the motif for uh, device, but it can be used as an interface for sending or receiving from. And that's why we have the driver. And finally, the light drivers are basically uh, emulated drivers. So everything that uh, that's defined in the want can be emulated by the light driver. And this is used to, for example, simulate not existing in uh, a uh, environments or to first set up the configuration before going on the field. You can simulate everything, then if all the, let's say, advanced parts work, are working, then we can uh, assign to the device configuration a specific network and then they will be uh, managed by the corresponding driver. So the idea is that, is that we start by simulating and then we specify better the single devices transforming them from just the line devices to, for example, one bus devices. Okay. Instead of analyzing in detail every driver, which would be long, boring, and useless, probably, uh, what we try to put here is uh, what's the structure of the driver, what are the, the mandatory parts, and what are the Optional ones. Oops, sorry. Um, a driver is usually organized in three different parts, of which one is mandatory, which is the network driver. Then there is an optional part, that means it might exist or not. It usually should exist, but as the uh, real dog implementation demonstrates it can be also not existing. Okay. Uh, and then there are device drivers. What are these different elements? The network driver is the one which handles the network communication. So it has the ability to speak to the network proper directly on the network. So to open a connection to the, uh, I don't know, what was the gateway, to handle all the connection issues, to understand the protocol, to send commands, to receive notifications, and so on. Okay. If the polling is needed, the Modbus example, for example, uh, the Modbus network, for example, is uh, it's a network that requires polling. That's not given notion inside the Modbus network. Also, the polling is ended by this driver. So the network driver communicates with the network and provides an event-based interface to all the other bundles.
not only it provides the network access APIs for the other components of the driver. So basically, this is the network interface. On top of the network interface, we need the driver for managing the device behavior. So there will be bundles offering, for example, the on functionality for a lamp. So there will be a lamp driver. It will be receiving a kind of lamp on common and transforming to a call on the API offered by the network driver for sending, for example, the message. So the network driver communicates and defines the API. Then there is this gateway driver. The gateway driver is there for supporting multi-gateway operation. In a general installation of DOC, we will have many trunks of the same network technology who can be interfaced by using different gateways over IP. So I will have, for example, of this area under a single IP uh, gateway. And then there will be, for example, a, a different area for the, the boiler building or for the central uh, the, uh, building. We are running also the same network, but they are accessible through a different gate because they, we, we divide the network in different pieces. In that case, we need this driver to decide, given a command, to which network part should be issued the command. So the network driver is the same because it is only to handle the common sending and the reception. But uh, what changes is the address where these devices are sent. And the gateway driver does exactly this. So manages the association between devices and gateways. So that if I'm saying lamp one on, lamp one is actually associated to the first gateway. So my converted command is issued to the gateway, to the first gateway IP address, and not to the second. And this association is managed by the gateway driver. Of course, if I have a gateway driver, all the other device drivers inside the single network uh, driver um, cannot run if until the gateway driver is available. Because otherwise, there's no way for understanding to which physical gateway the messages should be sent. So in order to have the network driver part, which is the one communicating on the network, that should run. After that, we will have the gateway driver and then the devices. And what the device server do is basically to expose the functionalities modeled by the rule. Okay. So a LAMP driver will offer an on method and an off method for each and that one. And a shutter driver will expose an up, rest, and down methods, and so on. Okay. So we have this kind of three layers, small layers inside the single network driver. One for communicating the network, one for handling gateways, and the other for exposing uh, the device representation. And this should be the same structure of all devices, of all, uh, sorry, of all uh, network drivers. I, I'm saying should be because unfortunately it is not. Okay, so there are another point of failure in DOG is that older drivers do not respect fully this specification, okay? But maybe they are just providing the network driver and device driver without the gateway driver. Okay, and also, uh, also these bundles do not have a specific layered architecture because they, they live almost at the, at the same level, uh, just besides the core, and they do different things. These are, uh, let's say this is a kind of uh, general group uh, for all the bundles that are add functionalities to DOG, but for which we do not have a specific layer position. Okay? And that's why they are called add-ons. And as you see, they, they are in fact quite diverse so one from the other. There is the rules bundle, which provides uh, a rule engine support for DOG. So we have this rule engine that can be programmed either from the 
uh, external application or from inner uh, log values, for example, the semantic as model can generate new transformation rules. Um, this rule bundle uses the JBoss rules engine inside um, and it can be programmed using XML based rule definitions. This XML based rule definition can come from external application. We are a thesis on this, uh, defining an interface for specifying rules. And it can use, it typically uses, let's say, notifications, so events coming from the network, as triggers for the rules, the current state of the house as a constraint, and then it will generate components as a result of the rule execution. So the typical form is, um, I don't know, when the door is open, so this is notification because the door sends an open notification when someone is opening the door. Uh, if the lights are off and the shutter are down, current state, then switch on the light, for example. Or raise up the shutter. Uh, there are specific triggers which are not notifications, but uh, they are defined time-driven triggers, which are basically timed rules. So at five o'clock, if the shutters are up, lower the shutter, for example, because the office, the office is closing, no one is in the room, and the shutter is closed. The power bundle and the power model bundle are twin bundles, so let's say, and Luigi is the one responsible for the development of these two bundles. Um, and they provide the, the power view of the uh, home representation. So all devices inside the home can have a power characterization provided by those two bundles together. In particular, the power model bundle provides the model of this power consumption, so every device has a typical consumption. It has a nominal consumption or a real consumption, okay? What changes is that uh, the typical consumption is the consumption you can find on tables, so you will have the tables uh, available on the internet or on manuals so saying, okay, a lamp usually consumes, I don't know, 75 watts, then you will have the nominal consumption, which is the consumption written on the single device, so this lamp is a 75 watt lamp, and then you can also have the hectare consumption. You take the lamp, you put it in an energy meter, and you discover that the lamp who has a, a 75 watt nominal power actually consumes 64.45 watts, which is the hectare power consumption. And of course the actual is more precise, but Maybe it's influenced by the context, because if you put the same lamp and you leave it here, connected to the meter for two hours, then the consumption changes because the lamp gets heated by a lighting, okay? so it changes. But anyway, we have this kind, these three level models, which allow to specify a finer uh, representation of the power consumed by a given device in the model. And this model can be used for estimating the current power consumption of the home, even if we don't have a meter. So if I don't have a meter inside the home, inside the building, but I want to estimate the current power consumption, I can use these figures. So I can use this model and the state of the house for providing a, an approximate measure of the current energy usage. And that's what uh, the power bundle does. And this is a, a little bit more complex because it, it not only provides this estimation, but it tries to uh, optimize, let's say, uh, this estimation by using all the available metering information in the network. So if we have just one meter that measures a, a subset of all the devices in the home, then the measures coming from the, this meter can be disaggregated and uh, 
behavioral or nominal values that we have in the model might be amended by these real measures so that we can improve the estimation of the power, even if we have a few points of measures. On the converse, if everything is measured, then this bundle will basically override the model, mask completely the information in the model, and just provide the information. So this is the, the role of the bundle. Right? Okay. Um, should we have five minute break? Yes, because it's a bit annoying. Okay, so let's have five minutes just to take a stop for a minute and come back. So. From now on, uh, we switch from the architectural view to uh, first uh, to the runtime view. So how dog operates actually in real time. So what are the, the steps involved in the uh, running, and then uh, on the development part. So how to develop for dog. Uh, so when we run dog, we have a startup phase where everything starts running. Uh, it changes a little bit from uh, the development uh, configuration to the real-time, uh, real-world configuration. Um, basically because when those runs in the development environment, uh, some part of the uh, startup tasks are directly done by the uh, integrated development environment, which for us, for the moment, is uh, Eclipse in the Helios version. Uh, we are not liking the version because the, the newer one are not working. So, do or better, dog is not working for the newer one because there are problems. Uh, but we hope to have it working maybe in the future. Without the hope, it must be working. <laughs> Anyways, <Anyway. laughs> um, the idea is that uh, in general, uh, the bundles start automatically. Uh, apart from a few core bundles uh, who need a specific order, all the others start automatically with the almost no order. They just start as soon as they can. Okay. So there is this framework bundle, which is the only one that should be run first because it provides all the functionalities and it corresponds to the SGI level, as we saw in the former slide. Um, after this bundle has started, all the others are starting in a given order that it might change on a, on a run with respect to another run. Okay? So how can they coordinate? That's the question. Uh, this is provided by the OSGI model. Basically all the bundles are consuming and exposing services and usually they can start working if the required services are available. So it doesn't matter the order because if a bundle who is uh, requiring a given service starts before the service, then it will wait for the service to become available before starting like really. Okay. So that's no order. Um, except for some bundles. For example, the auto start bundle is one of the first bundles to be started because it, it is needed for starting the other bundle part of the other um, So all the bundles start, when we run dog, we, we see many, many logs in the console or on the file, and it's really difficult to understand which bundle is starting, because actually they are all starting. What helps the bundle to be structured, to interact with, is that every bundle waits its needed services. So it starts, and before offering services, it waits for all the others. That means. So, the first bundle actually that start are those that do not need services. And they will be the library bundles in general. Okay. Because they do not need services, they just expose services. And so on. And all the dependencies are uh, resolved at runtime. 
because all the bundles are waiting for the others needed bundle. And this is very flexible because we can put new bundles or remove bundles even at runtime and everything works. One of the new functionalities in Log is that we can actually put, for example, a driver when Log is running, we put the, the new driver inside the driver folder and it gets started and once it's started it waits for all the needed services which are already running because Log is running and if we had a device previously unmatched, so I don't because that wasn't the driver, now that the new driver is there, a new attachment process will be run, and there might be a possibility for the device to be used. Okay, so that's the one of the advantage of this OGI structure is exactly this that we don't have a a predefined order, and we don't have to have everything there before running. Okay, and the life cycle is exactly this. Well, not exactly this. So, first step is all the bundles move from the uh, no state to the installed state, where basically the framework has recognized the presence of the bundles. But they are still doing nothing. After installation, uh, they start to live and they become, if all the offline dependencies, so if all the libraries, not the runtime, not the services, but the, the physical libraries they need are available, they become resolved. So everything for running the bundle is ready. At that point, all the bundles that do not have, do not have a, any online dependencies that do not depend on any service in the framework start. They start like a multi thread program. So they start uh, almost concurrently. And this is true, for example, for all the libraries bundles. So you will see all the libraries starting in mixing order that changes from run to run. After they start, they start exposing their services. Okay? One of the services, for example, uh, which are exposed first is the managed service uh, defined by the SGS specification, which is provided by the dog configurator. So the dog configurator uses anything else, usually starts very quickly with respect to the other, and then it offers the managed service to all the other bundles. So all the bundles who are waiting for configuration not run until the configurator is ready, because until that point, the service will not be available. Once the configuration becomes available, they start running. So they start asking the configuration and maybe publishing new services. For example, another crucial point in the startup phase of DOG is the availability of the house model. Because this usually arises uh, far later than all the other devices, especially if we are working with the semantic house model. The startup is really slow. So the first bundles will be the libraries, then will be the top configurator who provides the configuration to the semantic house model. Then the semantic house model starts. In the meanwhile, all the drivers have the time to start and configure themselves. All the add-on bundles probably will have the time to start. But all the devices, for example, need the semantic house model to be created. So even if most of the bundles are already started, they are waiting the model for, uh, for the gateway to start operating. Okay. So nothing happens because the model is still loaded. Once the model is loaded, then the device factory, which is the, the bundle responsible for generating all the device representation, can start because the model is ready, so it starts, it generates all the runtime instances of the devices represented in configuration, and after this, the device driver attachment gets started. So the idea is that we, not, we do not have a specified order, but we have dependencies that basically provide a, a rough order in the bundle start. And we are sure that all the bundles start only when they can be run. 
which is the, the only thing we need when we program a, a bundle. Okay, what happens on the driver side, which is the, the interesting part? Okay. Uh, we have the network, we have the, the home, we have the configuration okay, which represents the zone. Uh, it gets loaded, and our dog can interact with the network. What happens is that as soon as the configuration is available, in this case, uh, the dog configurator is referring only to the, the driver specific configuration. So, as soon as each driver specific configuration is available, the driver starts. Then they wait for the model for being available. In the meanwhile, there are a couple of other bundles who are the gateway drivers, if you remember. They are waiting for the network drivers to be started. So, dog configurator, network drivers, gateway drivers. After the gateway drivers, device, the single device drivers start, but they are still waiting for the model. Okay? So all the drivers are ready to work, but they do not match anything because the model is not ready. Once the model is ready, uh, the device actually starts creating one device instance for each device defined in the model. And once this instance becomes alive, then it is uh, taken by the device manager and matched against the currently active drivers. And there might be two results. One, uh, the instance matches, so there will be a score for this match, and if the score is sufficiently high, uh, in this moment, in dog if the score exists, basically, so if they match, then the driver and the device attach one to the other. So they become a kind of single entity, let's say, that exposes the device services the device functions to the rest of the dog. So once a lamp instance attaches a lamp driver, then by sending a non comma, by calling the home method of that lamp instance, we turn on the lamp connected to the network. Okay. If instead the driver and the device do not match, because for example I'm trying to match a, a connex lamp device instance to a, my home driver, they do not match the air of different technologies, then the device becomes idle. So the device is took by the device manager, matched against all the available drivers. If no driver is found, the device is marked as idle. So it's configured, it's uh, defined in the home configuration, but there is no one handling the device. So if we send a command to this device, the device will respond, I'm not active. I cannot do anything because there's no driver for the device. This, for example, enables at runtime to add further drivers. If I had another driver at runtime, then the idle devices are matched another time against the new drivers. And maybe this time they match. And this is the specification regulating all the attachment phase. I don't want to go in deep in the specification, just to highlight that this is not new, this is defined in the USGI framework. And we are implementing this device manager specification using the dog device manager bundle. So the dog device manager bundle is the device manager in the USGI framework. The device category who is used for uh, matching the driver and the device is implemented by the dog device category. And we start understanding one, why there are some names inside the bundles, okay, because we are implementing this specification. And on the other side, we have device driver, which basically implements the driver and the driver implementation that are defined inside this specification. So we are following this specification. And this specification also specifies uh, the interactions between the elements during the attachment process. So they should interact in a well-defined way. Okay. Okay. Finally, the device model. Actually, maybe we don't understand why the model was separated from the, the rest of the device presentation. That's why, because according to the SGI specification, it's a different part. It's the device implementation. Okay. That's it. This this was just to say, we are implementing the specification. Sometimes uh, 
some choices might appear strange, but it's because they are trying to implement the other choices. Okay, let's try to go back to the full architecture, very big, very noisy in the sense, and to see what happens when someone is sending a command or when something happens on the next one, just to have an idea of what are the bundles involved on the so we have an application dog, and we want to send a call from the application. Okay, let's go a little bit in the this is the dog architecture plus the driver layer. The same command coming down from the application arrives to the dog XML endpoint. And this is the path. From the dog XML endpoint it goes to the executor. And then to the model, it goes to the driver, and finally in the next. Okay. So there is this path yeah, going from the XML endpoint down to the executor because it's a common. Then the executor takes a, a device instance from uh, the set of instances defined by combining the information in the device tech and the device model and calls, for example, the home method. Calling the home method basically means traversing the application down to the driver, the specific driver, because the device is attached to a driver. Okay. And my view is the driver is the one bus driver. And when the device receives call on the home method, it calls the network driver API for sending the home call. And basically, it results in the network. So we have this top to down traversal. But also we can have the reverse, which is much more complex. So let's suppose that we have something happening on the network. So we have the application, we have top. In this case, something happens here on the network, top handles what happens and notifies the application. Okay, and this is really much more complex. Let's start. We have the notification rising up, going to the notification method, spreading on, on different devices, and then including, for example, going back. So this is complex. Let's just do it another time. I was using this fast animation just to make sure that they are, you feel the complication here. Okay. So what's happening here? Let's try to do it uh, slowly. We have something coming from the network, let's say on the HTML and the driver. When it arrives here, the driver converts the network message into a dog message. This message is sent as a notification to the notification manager. Okay. So it rises up here, filtered by this model, so it arrives like a lamp one switched on. Once the notification manager <coughs> receives the message from the driver, it generates the notification, so it publishes the event, basically. And all the registered listeners receive the event. In this case, for example, there might be this XML endpoint receiving the message because it, it must expose the events to the other application. The same echoes for the REST endpoint. The same echoes, for example, for the power bundle because the power bundle is listening for estimating the change in the current consumption of the home. And also the rules bundle is listening for changes because maybe there's a change that triggers one rule that requires a comment to be executed. So everything is dispatched towards the listener. And then every listener does something different depending on its own purpose. So for example, the XML endpoint is sending out the comment. The REST endpoint maybe is doing nothing, just accumulating the notification for being queried by the application. The power bundle, for example, estimates, updates to the estimate of the current consumption. And maybe the rule gets a trigger, and the trigger is inside one of the rules handled by the rules panel. 
and this in turn generates a command. So in this case, the rule, for example, sends a command to the executor as a consequence of the application, and this command travels down another time towards the drivers nested by the model, so the command will be for example switch lamp two on, and maybe the lamp two is on a different level, for example, okay, it comes here, now. So the idea is that when there are notifications from the network, might be there are several parts at the same time. Some of them are going outside, some of them may be returned. And this part that we saw uh, running from the driver to the rules panel and back into another driver, this is interoperation. Basically, we can bridge different technologies by using the me this mechanism. And we are not acting as a master or as a slave. We, we are actually acting as a bridge because the command might be sent from a network to another and vice versa. Okay, and this was the work. Now the hard stuff. <laughs> so, what we need to know and what we need to respect when developing for God. And these are uh, kind of guidelines we collected during development. Uh, some, sometimes in a hard way, sometimes in a more structured way. Um, and we start with our mantra. So the phrases you must repeat before starting to work in Dogon. And the phrases are, in, in Dogon we trust, which is a kind of declination of the in ontology we trust we had before. Dogon is the ontology we, we are using. Then the second, uh, similarly to the North Face mantra, which is never stop exploring, for us is never stop out of generation. So everything that can be generated by a program should be generated by a program and not by a human. Uh, and third, configuration first. That means every time you need something specific for a bundle, use the configurator. Don't use some kind of our code inside the bundle or some kind of files inside the bundle jar. It seems obvious, but when you start working, and there is not just one people working, but maybe 10 people working at the same time, these are not so obvious. And we have a couple of examples. Uh, okay, let's uh, go another time on the, on the first one. <laughs> so in, the, in the bonds we trust, we remember for the, I think, the 10th time today that we are working with, uh, with an ontology. So everything that is developed and that has to deal with devices in the bonds should respect the dog, on, uh, in dog should respect the dog representation. So if I'm writing a driver, and the device, uh, it's, uh, I don't know, a shutter, and in dog is more than like a, a device offering an up, down, and rest state, I should not have a moving state, even if it's reasonable. Okay? Because it's not defined. So the step is, first we check the ontology, then, if the ontology is sufficient, everything is specified. We can just develop our environment, for example. Or, if we feel that something is missing, before developing, we model. That means we coordinate with all the other people working in the in particular to those who are, who are maintaining the, the ontology, and Try to understand if what we feel as a needed change is actually something needed or not. If we agree to change ontology, we change ontology, and after that we start it out. Okay. So just to keep the ontology as, as a primary driver. Okay. Um, and once uh, modified or not the ontology, we always stick to that. So no variation. I know that it's a bit annoying because when we start developing, we have a kind of creative impulse that drives us. But we need to conform. If we want to uh, grant everything uh, working inside them, okay. And we need to remember that the bond is not only for description. So it's not a matter of, okay, it's not in the description, but I can add it and everything. No, because it takes place in very different parts 
of those. Uh, for example, at runtime, we are asking queries, asking configuration to the model. If the model is different from the actual implementation of some bug, maybe some question cannot be answered. So, some different work in that starting to emerge. Uh, the bundle for that manages the autology is providing this update, merging, and queuing functionalities, but if we are not aligning the implementation with the model, maybe we cannot exploit these functionalities. So we start to have a, a power model encoded in the power bundle, for example. And next time we won't be able to, to get the power information, for example, from one application. Um, and not only, the ontology is also driving the set of device classes inside. So if we model at the driver level a device having a moving state, but in the model, in the dog model, there isn't such a device, then also the library of devices won't have this moving state. So even if the state is in the driver, we won't be able to use it. Because all the libraries were, will be ignoring it because they are auto-generated from the ontology. And lastly, even if it seems a nonsense, but this is just for remarking another time that we need to stick to the model, that even when we don't use the model, we use it. Because we are working with configurations extracted from the ontology. So even if we are not using the model, all the device instances and models in the in dog are generated from the model. The configuration is extracted from the so if we manually modify the configuration, we are starting a risky trade because we are moving on a path with possibly divergence from the original specification. And here I was just citing the, the utility that we can use for translating a model to an XML model. There's this class that basically offers a main to run that transforms the ontology to an XML file. And last, on the ontology, otherwise it would be really boring. <laughs> this, uh, uh, this is a summary for where the ontology is used in DOM, almost everywhere. So this is the ontology. The ontology is uh, organized along a set of classes, basically dividing controllable things and not controllable things. And then goes deeper, defining the different device types and different capabilities and functionalities that this is used offline for auto generating part of the dog bundles. Online for configuring, for configuring uh, the specific home of so this room okay, to the, the model instances. That's why these are square, these are circles square sum instances. That means this lamp is the specific lamp installed in the kitchen, not the general lamp type. And this provides the own configuration. But we can also add some additional information to an input class, for example, the power consumption. This power model comes here, is injected into the model of the home, and gets that's why I'm insisting on, on this goal, because it's a driver from the Second, auto-generation. It basically comes from this uh, uh, permeation of the ontology inside all the aspects. Since we have this model, which is difficult to handle, which is computationally uh, greedy, in a sense, because we need to uh, use greedy processes uh, for handling it. If uh, we have an embedded PC, we are not able to deal with the ontology. Uh, these are the drivers for generating everything by programs. Because we can save time, save errors. We usually get a uniform structure. And we limit the points of failures to just two positions instead of many others. 
So, for example, in DOG, we generate over 400 classes from the ontology, all the one dealing with the uh, device libraries. And if we develop manually all of these 400 classes, we will have 400 different possible point of failures. But if we auto generate this, we have only two point of failures. One is in the generation process, and the other is in the template we use. So if we make an error in defining the template, then we will have an error, but we just need to modify the template correctly. Instead of trying to modify in the same way for hundred different classes, which I'm sure is not possible. Okay. Other advantages, uh, we avoid also annoying the developer. Because when you start developing a class which differs from the former class just by one string, at the third class you get really, really bored. And that makes help. Because after that you start making a thinking of other things. So why do we need to generate manually one when we can generate it by phone? It is quicker because for generating all those classes we take less than one minute. If we give it to a developer, it will get bored first, and it will get take at least one week for doing the same work with the errors. So another week for correcting the errors. And the other advantage is that if we program correctly the generator, and this is a big if, but we can, uh, modest changes in ontology can be faced without modification in the generator. So if we had classes typically, or if we had just modify existing classes or delete some classes, anything else is the same. The program is the same and everything works if we develop the generator properly. Of course, if there are major modifications, then the generator must be modified. So if we change the relationships, for example, or the properties, we need to modify the generator to account those properties. But if we just have one device type, no problem. The gener if the generator is programmed correctly, everything works. And this means that if I have a new network with new devices, my only concern is to develop the model. Because after that, I just hit run, and all the dog parts are generated. Uh, OK. So, let me see what some of the advantages. Ah, okay. Uh, so, where can we find out the generation in, in the Dogon source? There's a class for that, which is this Dogon dog. Um, and it is in the, the dog utilities bundle, which is actually not a bundle. <laughs> But it's packed with dog sources. Um, and if you have the ontology and you want to generate the dog classes, you just run it and you will get the, the source classes for the device library. Basically. Actually, you can also compile the classes, but we are not using this functionality anymore. Okay. So originally it was designed also to compile the classes and bundle them inside the jar. Um, so that's why I would say never stop auto generation. So if we can save time and errors by just writing one generator, then it's better to do that. Okay, and last configuration first. This is just a reminder for the early developers. So uh, everything should be in the configuration, nothing should be according to. This is a general rule in programming. We already we all know that rule, but we all commit the same error when we are uh, under pressing condition. <laughs> okay, so we say, okay, let let's just record this, and then I will change it and put it in configuration file. Then that recorded value will stay there for years. <laughs> okay, so this is just for us for, to remember uh, to avoid our coding, and most importantly to avoid configuration parameters when they are already available in the model. 
this was one of the biggest errors we had in those in the former versions and partly in the current. We have configuration, for example, for the IP address of the gateway, but this is defined in the logon instance. So we don't need this particular configuration in the driver configuration because we already have. <laughs> and this, when we start developing, we must be beware. We must beware the dog, which is usually hungry. <laughs> And saying, okay, these are general uh, implementation uh, guidelines. Let's say uh, me and Luigi try to write this down because we found many, many problems in the, in the code that was generated in, in time. And so we try to remember to ourselves what are the basic principles of programming. Then we think first, never start programming. We have uh, examples of entire bundles where. There are uh, 10 methods of which 9 are commented. That means that the one was, that was right was not thinking, probably. Uh, the second is comment, because if I'm writing a bundle and then I think in a bundle after one year, I need some information to handle it, to understand what I was doing. And sometimes it is useful for even designing the implementation. If I write what I want to do, what the method wants to do, then it's easier to write the method. And also here, we, in DOC, we have uh, many differences in the comment level. And there are a couple of bundles that every time we hope and we need a, at least half an hour to understand where to put the hands. Because we don't have comments, or they are very, very restricted. Uh, our code is the same, change the spelling, because Nothing is more annoying than looking at variables misspelled, like service or something like that instead of service. They are really annoying if you are working all the day with those kind of variables. And designing implement for the future, okay, is to say that when you start developing, maybe it's better to leave open some doors, to leave uh, some place where you can enhance so your implementation instead of just trying to work on the, the weakest uh, solution because it's sure that if you are working in dog after one week or two you will need to change it you will need to add some modification we have a day-to-day -day experience of that and if you don't develop for the future every time you need to redo it the same things more than once and the same for the housekeeping I was referring to those comments if, if, if you find that there are a news that Things, just remove them. We are using in dog and all the other project uh, source version, so you can safely remove. If you if you do an error, you have just to revert to the previous version and restart. No problem. And last but not least, document your ideas because after one here, maybe someone else is using your code, and it need, he needs to understand what you were thinking and why you develop the solution in the way. Instead of uh, another way. Okay, so by looking at the dog, this is beware of dog, the dog is happy because this is a good class. Okay, this, this was just for providing some examples that are inside of. Okay, so this is not invented for the part of the presentation, it's inside. Yeah, here the dog is happy because it, there is a, a big job of comments at the beginning explaining what the class is expected to do. There are no comments for all the variables. These are just variables usually not common. Or people usually not common the variable, but if we have the comment, it is much easier. On the converse, there might be situations in which the dog is a little bit angry and barking. For example, here, no comment. Let's imagine three pages, three screens written like this. It's pretty difficult to peer inside. Then we start looking at the code. Then we find a spelling error. So you are trying to amend the code, you write service speed, and nothing works because someone is programming using service speed instead of service. Okay. No comments in the ready set. 
And these are other errors. For example, the log level. This is a debug string logged as a one. That means that we, when we run dog, we will have a couple of lines in the log of the console which are useless because they are just debug information, but they are not as uh, nearly ever. Okay. So this is, this was just to say, okay, inside dog, we it seems that we are a little bit picky on uh, on these stupid things, but inside dog we have this variety of code from the, from the good code. To not so good. Okay, so that's why we were trying also to provide the guideline with this. Okay, so uh, the guideline that we need to follow is to say check the ontology, and we already know, now we have full of the ontology requirements. Uh, second, respect the SCI specification. So if I'm trying to do something which I suspect to be in the specification, then it's better to read the specification, maybe ask someone else that knows better about the specification. And if a specification is there, then that's the only correct choice. So there are no other ways if we want to be maintainable and portable to the next generation. Uh, after that, as a third instance, respect the architecture. So don't start putting pieces around. But we have the layers well defined, we can develop inside. We do not have to duplicate functions in dog. So if we have to use something which is already there, maybe we can amend the existing bundle to expose the services instead of rewriting the services from scratch at the time. And one list that we usually encounter, but it's to be avoided, is to mix different architectural levels. So for example, a mixing a driver implementation with a device implementation or something like that. Uh, this is more when you start developing, so not, not every one of us has to face these issues, but the one who is working inside of should always uh, develop a self-contained contribution. So if I'm working, uh, I need to identify what are the boundaries, where I'm impacting other bundles and maybe other persons working on the bundles, and on those interfaces, on those boundaries, I need to negotiate. Uh, the interactions with the other developments, because otherwise we get isolated parts and have isolated parts. If I don't usually do. Um, the same working team. This is more for uh, us than and for people starting uh, to work in the code. Okay, so this is a kind of a self uh, complaint. Uh, the guideline is never commit not working solution. This is the general use case in a distributed environment. So if you are working on something, unless the this something compiles, it's okay, it works, do not commit. Because if you are committing, maybe you are impacting the work of others, working on other parts of the framework of the dog, so avoid it. And especially check that your solution does not impact the other's work. Otherwise, negotiate the interactions. Um, and second, it should not be there, but we, we see many of these errors. So always do complete commits. That means if you are committing source, please commit also to libraries and sources and so on. Because otherwise, the people will get the source who is not compiling because they are missing libraries. And working in team, another good way of working, especially if you are using SVN and not, and not Git, is to always update before committing, because otherwise we will surely generate conflicts. Okay. Because unfortunately, SVN has been designed to work on the central repository. So if you work on a misaligned for an older version, and then you try to commit, you get a couple of merge errors due to the fact that you forget to uh, update before starting to work. Okay. <laughs> These are really specific comments, but we have this problem. So that's why we decided to put that 
here. Uh, and the same from the dead or wrong code policy. That means if you have that code, remove it. We have the SVN server working for us. So if it wasn't, then we can always revert back. Uh, if uh, the code is not working or it's incomplete, we are starting from this January. We will apply a, a policy that says if you don't change on your the incomplete component, or if you don't uh, correct the component, we will delete it after one month. Okay. So, for example, <laughs> just for citing one, uh, we just checked it on Friday, and after three months and uh, one May, the dog effect is still not working, not compiling. So the, the decision here will be removing it. <laughs> Someone is uh, <laughs> acknowledging. <laughs> okay, so the idea is that pay attention to these things because we need to work together. Uh, and last thing added by Luigi, which is <laughs> really important remember that every bundle is a different SVN project and then it deserves a different trunk, branches, and tags. Order. Last, okay, we, these are general guidelines, really, really general. We don't need to, to know them because we, we should apply them always. But anyway, be collaborative. That means uh, anytime that you find some problems, try to correct them. We are working on the distributed environment. Maybe I find just some problematic code that impacts on my bundle, I may correct it and update on the other developers. So that if I have some doubts or if I'm not sure on the solution I'm taking, maybe I can explore the opinions of the other developers. Sometimes it's insightful. Uh, especially if we are planning new versions, so we can say, we can meet at the coffee machine and say, okay, it's really needed this new feature because otherwise we won't get over these problems. And this is not just taking coffee, but it's improving the code. Uh, and the same of before. So always develop for the future. And that's it. If you have any comments, questions, problems. <laughs>